There's a tool for front-end developers that I'm 95% sure you've never even heard about that is insanely useful. This hidden tool is a game changer that allows you to develop, debug, and test all with zero reliance on your backend. Let's say you're a front-end dev working on a professional team, or you're making a side project with your friends and you're in charge of the front-end. Your backend guys said they would create some endpoints that you can use, but being the go-getter that you are, you want to get started right away. You shoot your backend guys a text and say, hey, is this endpoint ready? After getting ghosted for three days, they finally respond with this. And that's it. You can't really work on anything in the front end until the back end is set up. You're just out of luck. Or are you? Not yet, because you have a great idea. You're going to take the response schema that you guys all agreed upon for this endpoint, you'll go to ChatGPT, and ask it to generate a bunch of fake data based on this schema. Then you'll take this fake data that it spits out, and copy and paste all of it into your code. That way, you can use this fake data as a placeholder until the real data actually comes through. Problem solved. But wait. Two weeks goes by and you finally get the text back that the endpoint is ready to go. So you delete the copy and paste the data from JADGPT, you start setting up your query functions, your loading spinners, your suspense boundaries, error catching, and you realize that hooking up the endpoints actually takes some time and now you're just playing catch up. Your manager comes up to you and says, hey, what's taking so long? Back and finish their changes, we're just waiting on you now. As you're sitting there contemplating a career change, you ask yourself the age-old front-end question. Wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to entirely rely on the back-end to at least get started on the front-end? Man oh man, do I have a video for you. So what is the secret that I'm talking about that will magically fix this entire problem? Well, let's rewind. After you knew the endpoint wouldn't be created for a while, you got some fake data from ChatGPT or some other AI. Once you have some fake data, here's where the actual trick comes in. In your code, do not just copy and paste this fake data as a placeholder. Instead, set up your query functions, your external API calls, and whatever else you need to as if the endpoint was already created and working perfectly normal. Once you have this basic setup, go to your web page. Then open up your dev tools. Head over to your network tab and if you've hooked up your query functions as if they work, you should see them in here. We'll go ahead and refresh and you can see we have a couple of requests in our network tab. Likely you're going to get some sort of error like a 404 not found. If your endpoint isn't implemented yet, this is exactly what you should expect. And likely this 404 will cause your page to crash or error out. Here's where the trick comes in. Right click on this request in the network tab and find this text right here that says override content and go ahead and click it. And there's going to be something that pops up usually at the top of the dev tools like I have right here that says to select a folder to store override files in. If you click select folder, it'll open up your computer's file directory. Make a new folder, doesn't matter where you do it and go ahead and name it something like Chrome overrides. If you're using another browser like Edge or Safari, name it after that browser instead because what I'm about to do is browser specific. Once you've selected that folder, it may ask permission to let DevTools edit files. If it does, just say yes. Once you've done that, you're going to be taken to the Sources tab here in the DevTools where you can now see the response that you are getting back from the endpoint. In our case, it's an error saying not found. Now here's what we've been waiting for. Instead of being a noob and copy pasting your ChatGPT fake data into your code and making all those weird modifications to try and make it work, take that fake data and copy and paste it directly into this menu instead. If you try pasting it in here, it might have this menu saying, do you trust the code? Just go ahead and say allow pasting if it asks you and click allow. And then it should now allow you to paste the code into this file. And then just control S to make sure it is saved. Now, if we go back to our page, let's go ahead and close our dev tools for a second. And let's refresh. Our page now loads with this fake data, despite the fact that we're querying for an endpoint that doesn't even exist. This trick that I've just shown you is known as local overrides, and it's essentially a brand new feature natively supported in all major browsers. Once you set up an override like this one, what your browser will do is if it sees a request for an endpoint that matches an override, in our example, the user's endpoint, it completely ignores what the endpoint is actually returning and just smacks your data on there instead. It doesn't matter if the endpoint returns error 404, a bunch of JSON data, or the entire script to the B movie. No matter what, your local data that you put in your override takes precedence and will overwrite whatever the backend returns. In order to do this before, you needed some external tools like Fiddler, but just last year in 2024, the major browsers like Chrome, Edge, Safari, Firefox, and more added native support for it. No external tools needed. So why is this trick actually useful? Well, first of all, if you're working on a full stack app and end up having to copy and paste some fake data directly into your code, it can lead to a lot of uncaught issues. 
Getting data on your page directly from hard-coded data is way different than setting up code to actually query for the data externally. By using local overrides, you can set up your query functions and everything regarding your endpoints as if they were already created, meaning it can speed up development a lot. The main idea is, as long as your fake data matches an agreed-upon schema, then as soon as your backend gets the endpoint implemented, all you have to do is remove the override by going back to Overrides in the Sources tab, right-clicking on the override that you made, and just clicking Delete. And then the front-end and back-end are already hooked up. There's no weird intermediary phase of changing a bunch of your code for testing fake hard-coded data, and you actually get to test things like loading spinners, error catching in case you get a 400 response, and so forth. TLDR, this tool puts the power back in the hands of the front-end developer. As a front-end dev, you can now move at your own pace and you're not completely restricted on what you can do by what the back-end provides. This remains true whether or not you're a front-end developer on a professional team, whether you're just doing a project with your friends, or whether you're using an external API from some other service. For example, let's say NASA is in the process of creating an API to see all the images for the Perseverance rover. And you want to make a cool React app that calls these endpoints and displays them in a really cool way. They say it'll still be a while before all the images are available, but like most APIs, they give you the general response structure ahead of time. Cool, so you can use what we just learned to take that structure, make some fake data with it, and slap it into your browser overrides. That way you can develop your web app exactly the way you would otherwise. Once the data is all readily available, remove the override and boom, you're instantly good to go. Zero time wasted. This is not the only use case of override content though. In the context that I've shown so far, it's amazing at replacing content that doesn't show up at all in the case that you're getting some sort of not found error. However, what if I actually am getting data returned directly from an endpoint, I just want to change how it looks for the sake of testing or debugging. No problem, that's super easy to do as well. For example, in this case, let's say I'm not getting any error anymore and my backend is actually returning data as expected for this user's endpoint. But I think to myself, what happens if these people's names on these cards over here are overflowing or just super, super long? I wanna test that possible case. So instead of trying to mock fake data inside the code or manipulate a bunch of CSS in my inspector, I can instead just go over here I'm going to copy this whole thing, so Control a to select all, and then Control c to copy it. Go to Override Content, click it, and let's replace what we have in here so far with the override. Go ahead and save it here. We'll take Christy Nicholas, for example. Let's take her name, and let's put a bunch of characters in here. Go ahead and save it. Refresh the page, and now we can see exactly what it looks like if there is somebody that has a name that is super, super long. Obviously, it doesn't look great, and because I was able to override the content and manually change the data in here, I was able to uncover this rather ugly styling issue we got going on here. So essentially, if you need to manipulate the data in any way, like we just did here, to test any possible case for any sort of debugging, override content is going to be a tool that you can use. As another example, what if I just want to test data corruption? After all, not every backend is perfect, and the data might end up having issues. So what will happen if I just completely delete, for example, the email and age field for this user right here, go ahead and save it, and then refresh the page. We can see the page just completely blanks out, which indicates that we're probably getting some error. With override content, we were able to test that and see what happens. Knowing that, now we know that, okay, maybe we need to have some error boundary to check to make sure that all the users have all their fields that they need to display the cards. Or maybe we want to see what the empty state looks like. When there's no 404 error or anything, but the data that's returned is just completely an empty array. With override content, we could do that. Go to override content, go to the content here, just take this whole array and just make it a completely empty array. Now we can say, okay, what does the empty state look like? In our case, it's not gonna display anything, but maybe in your case with an empty array, you need some sort of empty state. What I'm trying to get at with all these example cases is that if there's anything, like absolutely anything you need to test on the front end, that in any way involves data coming from some network request, you can use override content to simulate whatever scenario you want. It speeds up development, speeds up testing, and especially can speed up debugging. The main reason why I wanted to share this video with you guys is that I actually did not know about this tool till recently, and many other people I know also had no idea this tool existed. I had this exact scenario happen to me at my job recently, where there was an endpoint for a feature that I was working on that wasn't gonna be implemented for three to four weeks but I was still expected to complete the majority of this feature before the endpoint even existed. A coworker showed me override content and it was a complete lifesaver. I spent the next few weeks making the feature and once backend got back to me and said it was finished, I literally just removed the override and it worked flawlessly. 
because of this one tool, I was able to develop, debug, and test all independent of my backend, all at my own pace. Hopefully after watching this, now you're able to add this really cool tool to your arsenal to make you an even better web dev. Take care everyone, and I'll see you in the next one.